Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming out. Um, I'm going to talk to you about what physics can teach us about learning, which is uh, a little bit cryptic, but I hope it'll all become clear. My name is uh, Marianne Hogeveen. Um, I'm a mathematical physicist turned data scientist turned data farmer, I call myself these days. But I'm not going to talk about that, actually. You can ask me about it later if you want. I'm actually going to talk about what all this means. So as a physicist, like physicists have a really obnoxious habit of always thinking they have a deeper understanding of why everything is the way it is. I see a physicist nodding over there. <laughs> it's true. Uh, and for this talk, I'm actually, I normally, I normally try not to do that, but I'm, I'm going to fully lean into that for this talk. So, but hopefully it'll be fun enough that you'll forgive me. So what these uh, articles are talking about, so there's a Physics Today article, quite recent, March this year, and it's something about machine learning meeting quantum physics, and the right one is actually a few years old already, and that's very, very dramatic. Uh, something about deep neural networks and the nature of the universe sharing links or something. That's really something physicists love. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about what these people mean. So. Um, the crux of the question is, empirically, we know that some deep learning protocols work really, really great. And actually, during our last talk, we saw a lot of examples. So you try all these things and make this really, really elaborate network, and it does awesome things. But why? Because actually, very, very naively, uh, physicists also like to pretend to be very naive, uh, the problem appears actually quite challenging. Uh, you have a lot of pixels. Uh, in this case, it's a very, very simple case. Pixels are black or white, and you have to compute these probabilities for all these pixels, and there's a lot of them. So why is it actually easy? Well, let's take a tiny little bit of a sidestep. What, can, what does maths actually have to say about this? Well, I'm just going to skip to the end. Um, they, they just say that neural networks, they can approximate any smooth function. So most of them in any case, and, uh, but it, it doesn't give any guarantees of how uh, many nodes they will have, so they can get very, very large. Um, and you can read uh, those articles at the bottom. So the question then is, um, why are they still useful, these neural networks, right? So the, the, the reason probably is, if you have all these possible functions, these many, many functions that you can approximate, Maybe it's only a tiny uh, number of functions that we actually care about. And then the question becomes, how do neural networks manage to learn actually functions that are uh, what we care about? So I'm going to take some hints from physics. So one thing physics talk about a lot is scale. So object detection, for example, uh, in machine learning, inherently has scale, right? Here you see a bicycle. But if you zoom in a lot, um, there's no clear reason why those pixels being, this one being uh, black and that one being white, means that it's a bike. Similarly, there's actually a tiny bicycle over there. I mean, if you zoom out that much, it doesn't really matter that it's a bike either. So if you see these two bikes here, you know that they're the same, but on the right, they look very different, similar with the cats, and on the left, they all look the same. Tiny confession. Actually, I was lazy, and I took just the bike, and I copied it four times. But none of you noticed, and that's the point. <laughs> so physics also has implied scale. So you see this bar magnet, and you look at the constituents, and they're all these little spins, and they're interacting with each other. But it's very unclear what exactly about these interactions makes this a magnet. So what you need to do is, you need to zoom out, and you see there are those magnetic domains. But if you zoom in again, in the, at the detailed level, it is not clear at all. So the way physics deals with this is what we call renormalization group. I'm not going to explain exactly what that term is. Uh, I'll just pretend that everybody knows. <laughs> Hopefully it'll be an, a sort of intuitive enough. So what happens is, um, you have this uh, basic uh, description that, that we understand well as physicists. And here, it's very generally written down. This describes the physics. Spins interact according to some 
interaction strength with each other. And then what we do is we say, all right, um, we combine all these spins together into a smaller number of super spins. And those are actually not any, anything physical. They don't exist. Um, they just behave like spins, and we call them quasi-particles. And we describe this new system via a similar looking equation. The super spins interact with other interactions, and the whole magic happens during this step. So this step basically is done in a way that all the macroscopic behavior, what we call the macroscopic physics, has to be preserved. So that's where the that's how you decide what these uh, interactions look like. And we can actually keep doing that. Every step you do more granular, more granular, until you reach the level that you care about. And every time, those interactions change and change. So let's take a simple example. We have this lattice, we have one uh, interaction on the horizontal uh, ones, and then two different ones on the vertical ones. So this is a three-dimensional space of uh, interaction strengths. And we start at this point. This is before, this is our fundamental level. So after a few of these steps, we reach another point. So now we have different, different interaction strengths. And what we can actually see is that the first one increased a little. We call that relevant. The second one decreased, it, which we call irrelevant. And the third one also increased, so that's also a relevant variable. So relevant basically means relevant at the large scale that you care about. Um, one thing to note is this is unsupervised. We don't tell nature what to do. That's the point. We, we, we say the description has to match what nature does. So this is unsupervised learning. So, actually, there's a direct equivalence in machine learning. We call them restricted Boltzmann machines. And the way you train them is exactly the same. So you have visible nodes. These are, let's say, the spins that we saw. And then you have hidden nodes. And if it's a smaller number of hidden nodes, basically you're compressing. But you can also increase it, actually. But we're going to care about compressing. So you can see, uh, basically, uh, someone, um, the, the bottom link is actually uh, people who made this link very clear between renormalization. Um, the, the slides will be posted. And again, actually, uh, the macroscopic property should not change, which looks slightly different in uh, images than in physics. Um, you look more, care more about the distributions um, that should remain the same, but it, it's, it's the same process. So the way you use this in machine learning is that first you do pre-training. So that's where all the renormalization steps uh, feature. So you pre-train from your image to hidden layers uh, that are smaller, another step, another renormalization step, hidden layers is smaller, etc., until you reach your final layer, which is quite small, and it should be small enough so that it quite, so that it exactly captures the features that actually make a bike a bike. And after you have done that, that's when you uh, unroll, is what they call it. Basically, you duplicate the exact thing, and this becomes your um, an encoder and a decoder. So this becomes part of your of your um, of your network, eventually. So you you train it in a way that you can generate these um, slightly blurry images from the crisp ones. So from this part, the takeaway is that if, if in physics we have relevant fields, which are features in machine learning, irrelevant fields are actually what we consider noise, and you can compress by uh, using renormalization. But another question is, um, why does this work? And another, uh, the reason for that is physics um, is actually simple. Uh, what, what do I mean by that? Physical theories that capture the behavior at any given scale tend to be very simple. 
Um, in renormalization group, I will not explain this. You can find a lot of uh, uh, good material around ab about that. But very high dimensional couplings tend to be irrelevant. So this has to do with, you can, you can derive this from how you uh, do the renormalization. You do a renormalization and a rescaling and the dimensionality features in it, which makes very complex fields uh, irrelevant, typically. But you can also have a bit of a basic intuition. If you have a lot of symmetries, there are more ways in which you can reach that state. So you can rotate this or flip it, and it's the same. So simple things tend to pop up more often for that reason. Another way of looking at this, and that actually kind of um, harks back to the talk before me, if you can generate something via a simple way, you should also probably see this more often happen in nature. So you can see, uh, for example, snowflakes. There, this is some, some kind of snowflake uh, generating method. The algorithm is very, very simple. You start with a triangle, and all the lines you replace by a line with a little triangle on it, and then you repeat, and that's it. Very simple algorithm. Nature can do it easy. So this is the algorithm, step one, step two, three, four, and already after four steps, you get this quite complex looking structure, but actually the algorithm is simple. And that's the point, you see a lot of that in nature. Very complex looking things that are generated by such a simple algorithm that it was actually quite unlikely for it not to happen. So I'm going to end with a bold statement because physicists love bold statements. Physics has a simplicity bias. So this is not a bold statement because I'm a physicist and I can say whatever I want about that. But now I'm gonna make it really bold. The world has a simplicity bias. Uh, and of course, there's the parts that we're probably typically interested in describing most of the time, probably. So thank you for that. There's a lot about this topic that I couldn't really uh, cover. Um, for example, well, there's uh, empirical proof why neural networks are biased uh, naturally towards simple functions, and somebody did the work. Um, actually, a quantum many-body function, which is something that exactly describes a quantum material, you can find an exact mapping between that and a special type of neural network called a tensor network. And if you want to learn more about other topics, quantum machine learning or entanglement, Visit our talk tomorrow. <laughs> the cat's alive. <laughs> it is. It is alive. Tomorrow in Pentop South. So I uh, hope to see you then. And I'll take any questions. <laughs> any questions? Well, I should imagine that RBMs were, uh, um, were, I mean, RBMs are later than, um, uh, than the technique of renormalization I talked about. And it's a one-to-one -one mapping. So RBMs, so renormalization group is already like 50 years old or something. So, I mean, that, <laughs> that is an example. Um, sorry? Ah, I see, I see. Uh, sorry, I haven't... Um... Yes? Uh, you mentioned about how uh, simplicity is at the crux of many, uh, many designs in nature. So, for instance, uh, over like if you're looking at a high-dimensional aspect, you might, you might not need that when you're, say, recognizing an image or recognizing a bicycle. Uh, and overcomplicating it might kind of leave you astray. But, but if your task is not... see a high dimensional aspect of it. Maybe by the brand sign or something else on the bike. Then it would be that you should weed out the low dimensional thing. Okay, look at only the high dimensional space, right? 
that's not necessarily high dimensional, it's just specialized. But in principle, um, in principle, you, you could probably uh, whittle the, the difference between one brand and another down to uh, a feature that you can summarize actually probably in a simple way. So, uh, sorry, I'll repeat, repeat the question. So the question was, if, you, if, if an object that you're trying to detect moves in time, um, how would you deal with it in a practical way, rather than... The object itself changes with time. Yes. Um, again, the change itself is probably something that you can summarize in a simple way. It's probably something you could extract out that... Um, I mean, I, I don't know exactly how that would happen or what would happen, but, but as you say, like physical theories, typically we say, well, a lot of things are invariant, the same ideas you use in machine learning, a lot of translation invariants, et cetera. Uh, and I think similar, similar ideas would be used to say, well, this thing morphs in time in a way that we accept. So we train for that, and that property of how it morphs would... Um, would, would enter as sort of a, probably a, a relatively simple feature. I don't know how, because that's the point, it'll extract it, but yeah. You're welcome. Any more questions? Yes? One in the back? Oh. To be honest, I'm, this is my hobby, so I don't know exactly the state of the art of the research in that respect. Um, machine learning is being uh, applied in a way to, um, to make computational physics a much more uh, rich and feasible field. Um, but for that, uh, we, can, we can talk about that later. What's another question? Um, Just wondering, yeah. you might approach that. So, in a physical way. In a physical way. Wow. <laughs> um, so, I would say, as a physicist, um, I probably would say this is, this, is, um, this is a case that's more suitable for the machine learners with the leaky relu and all the... <laughs> I'm more... Uh, I'm more uh, interested in uh, conceptually how the um, conceptually why we think that maybe a, a type of um, network might be suitable for a type of problem. So maybe the previous speaker is still around. You can ask him. <laughs> Are we out of time or? Okay, are there any more questions? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, there's already a lot of work um, uh, in generative tensorial networks. I did not think 25 minutes was a suitable time to try to venture into that as well. Um, 
there are um, what I'm really uh, interested in is how these generative tensorial networks. So basically, these are you can view them also as neural networks. You can treat them that way, um, but because you can also view them as uh, things that describe um, many body quantum systems, you also have basically all the entanglement measures and all the other physical measures that you can that you can glean from them and all the other interpretations. So very often it's the interpretation of something as something else that uh, really provides you new insights. So I think uh, if you want to if you want to um, do a random walk in Happy Land, I would say uh, Google generative tensorial networks and have fun. I think that's all for today. Thank you, everyone.